So oh, it's so good to see everyone. All right, so I'm gonna get us started since we only have an hour. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying I'm Elisa from Pilatesology and thank you all so much for being here or for attending or for watching the recording later. Um, I always, I've always loved being, I'm, I'm a huge avid reader and I got the idea to have this book club because Cheryl Turnquist, who you can see here, uh, Nabi Jung and Vivian Picone Jung all um, hosted, started their own book club, or it was really Cheryl's idea, I believe. Um, and I attended one recently uh, with Eva, or Eva, do I pronounce your name Eva or Eva? It's Eva. <laughs> Eva, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to yeah. get everyone's name right. Um, with Eva, um, whose book I had read many years ago and loved. So I was particularly thrilled to attend that book club and uh, it immediately made me want to have one for Pilatesology, and here we are. So I'm going to turn it over to Nabi to introduce what's happening today and give you guys some little housekeeping tips. And um, thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Elisa. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Welcome to the very first Pilatesology book club. And thank you so much for attending. We really appreciate everyone who came out to spend a little Sunday with us. Um, and before I start, I would like to give special thanks to some very important people. Um, one is Eva herself and her publisher, Nicole, from Inner Strength Publishing. If you haven't got the book yet, um, still, please <laughs> stay in the meeting. We are so happy to have you here. There's no need to have read the book before you come to this presentation. And if you still would like to buy it, you can buy it at innerstrengthpublishing.net. Um, Nicole, the publisher, um, has given us all a discount to get the book, and that was so nice of her. And we're so thankful that she could help connect us with Eva and get this um, event started. And also, I really want to thank Cheryl, who was the impetus to this book club sensation. So this is a free meeting for all Pilates and movement enthusiasts, um, fans, geeks, uh, those kinds of things where you love learning about the method and love learning um, about movement. And this is sponsored by Pilatesology in partnership with my company, Prospire, the Providence Pilates Center and Authentic Method Pilates. And we hope through these meetings that you'll find fresh inspiration for your workouts and some rest, relaxation, and community building. Uh, you probably already know about Pilatesology if you're here, but for those who are not subscribers, it's an amazing resource for students and teachers where you can get unlimited streaming of classic Pilates for only $20 a month. So if you have not already, I would highly recommend checking out their vast library of Pilates resources from some of the top teachers around the world. Um, I myself am Navi. Um, it's so nice to meet you. I'm the founder of Prospire, which is an app created for Pilates teachers, by Pilates teachers, to help independent instructors create amazing experiences for their clients and thrive in the ever-changing wellness market. It's free to download and use, and I would love to personally walk you through the app. Um, if you DM me on social or fill out the form on our website, I'm always happy to connect and help familiarize you with the product. So now um, I would love to introduce you to our moderator, Cheryl, and our presenter, Eva. Cheryl Turnquist is, the, is a Power Pilates Master Teacher Trainer and has studied Pilates since 1999. She is the proud owner of the Providence Pilates Center in Providence, Rhode Island, which opened its doors in 2001. Cheryl received her BA from Providence College and her master's in social work from Boston College. Cheryl was first trained in Pilates by the Physical Mind Institute. She then began studying the Power Pilates method and earned her bridge certificate in 2006. Cheryl became a teacher trainer for Power Pilates in 2012 and is also PMA certified. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Cheryl had a stroke of genius to start the Pilates Book Club as another fun way to connect clients and teachers over Pilates. And when I heard about the book club, I felt so inspired, just like Elisa. And I thought that it was an event that totally aligned with my company's mission um, and just a great way to build community. And so the book club uh, invited Eva and this is and it all got started. And it's thanks to Cheryl that we were able to coordinate this event and get it together for everyone. 
And for those who are interested in attending our next meetings, the next book will be Love All Around by Kathy Barker Strack, a biography on Romana Krasinowska. And it's a wonderful read about Romana, who um, I'm sure a lot of people know and love. And then after that, we'll, we'll be reading Breath by James Nestor, which is an insightful book on the difference between nose and mouth breathing and how breathing really affects um, our life and sort of the lost art of how to breathe. Um, so that's a really interesting read. And then after that, our next book that we have lined up is My Enchanted Life by Lolita San Miguel, who is, it's an autobiography and she is a living Pilates elder and she will be coming also to speak with us along with Kathy Bargerstrack and James Nestor. So these authors will all be speaking with us in the next coming months and we really hope that you can attend. Um, so now onto our speaker, Eva. Eva Rinke Lee lives in Stuttgart, Germany with her family. She is a historian, writer, and copy editor. Eva studied history and philosophy at Humboldt University in Berlin. From 2007 to 2010, she worked at Buchenwald Memorial doing research for an exhibition about forced labor during World War II. She later worked as a freelance historian for several historical institutions in Germany and Austria and wrote articles for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's Encyclopedia of Camps and Ghettos. Eva began taking Pilates lessons to get back into shape after giving birth to her first child. After her lessons, she would walk home and she would hear stories about Joseph Pilates during her lessons and talk about them with her other students. And she became interested in Pilates' life since he was also a German national. She couldn't find much information about him, so she decided to research him herself. After two years of research in 2015, her bi biography on Joseph Pilates was published in German by Herder Verlag. Subsequently, she gave lectures and workshops about Joseph Pilates in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, France, Great Britain, Brazil, and in the US. And in 2019, the English translation was published by Inner Strength Publishing Eva now works for the online team of consumer rights organization and is currently in charge of webinars, webinars and podcasts about consumer rights. So please welcome Eva and Cheryl, I think we'll do some more housekeeping about going on mute and other Zoom etiquette. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Debbie. I am so excited to be here. And um, I, we have people here from all over the world. So um, if you haven't done that already, you can put in the chat where you're from. Um, we're very excited for those of you who could attend live. Um, I can't wait to have a discussion here with you. Um, just a couple of things though, from a housekeeping standpoint, um, if you could all be on mute throughout the discussion, that would be great. It just helps us with feedback and our, um, our volume here. And then um, if you're familiar, there's the chat option. So you can chat in throughout the discussion and Nabi and I will be monitoring the chat room. Um, if you want to raise your hand and um, speak out loud and go off mute, there's a reactions button um, emoji that you can click and it has the raise hand feature. Um, if that doesn't work and you want to give a big wave, we'll, we'll find you and you can come on that way. Um, so we do want this to be interactive. AFA has an amazing, super interesting presentation that I can't wait to watch here with you guys. And after that, we'll have some time to um, do some questions and answers. So um, Monica here is from Mexico. We have people from Austria, the East Coast, the West Coast. Um, uh, Houston, Greenwich, Connecticut, San Diego. So everybody, thank you so much for attending. Um, I know that you're gonna have a great time this hour that we're here together. So um, without saying too much more, I'm gonna pass this off to Ava. She's gonna start her presentation and we can take it from there. Go ahead, Ava. Hi, um, yeah, hello everybody. Um, I'm so happy to be here today and, and thank, you, thank you everyone for coming. And yeah, it's just wonderful to see some live people. <laughs> Um, we're still pretty much locked down here in, in Germany and yeah, it's just great to, to see you all and I'm really looking forward to answering your questions. I hope you have um, many questions about Joseph Pilatus and his life and his time. 
And I will just, um, yeah, to get us all into the um, <laughs> um, into the subject, um, I will start and show you a presentation which I called "Beer and Boxing," <laughs> because that was how Joseph Pilates was earning his living when he was still living in Germany. So I will focus on his early years and, and the time until he emigrated to New York and started his studio and his new life there. Um, Joseph Pilates was born in Mönchengladbach in 1883. And um, he was born in this house. <laughs> you see it on the picture. Um, it's a house in Waldhausener Straße in Mönchengladbach. And if you ever have the chance to go there, um, when we can all travel again, um, I, I would highly recommend it to go there and just you can walk through the street. It uh, looks pretty much um, the same as it, as it did um, when the picture was taken. Um, Joseph Pilates, um, the name um, derived um, from a homestead which was close to um, Mönchengladbach. It was called Platesgut. And um, until today, um, in the area, there are many people um, with family names like Pilates, Plattes, Plattes, and all that kind of names. But um, when Joseph um, was living in New York and in the 1950s and 1960s, he actually used to tell people um, that he had, he had, um, he was born in Germany, but he had Greek heritage. And, um, I found this very interesting because I had many Greek friends when I was writing the novel <laughs> and I thought uh, this would be a fun detail to tell them. And when I came to Mönchengladbach, um, to the city archive where I started my research for the book, um, the archivist, he showed me, um, records, registration cards, church books, and, um, documentation of the Pilates family living in the area of Gladbach for 300 years <laughs> before Joseph was born. So um, this was definitely one of the myths um, that he told about himself. And um, but um, fortunately, I, I found out many other things which were quite as interesting. <laughs> so I, I went on and, and kept on doing research and um, started writing the book. Joseph's childhood in Mönchengladbach was actually pretty tough. So um, at, um, when I showed you the photo of the house, um, the family only lived in this house for one year and they kept moving around in, in Mönchengladbach. They ch kept changing apartments. The family was growing bigger all the time. Um, Joseph Pilates had eight sisters and brothers and three of them, the three youngest of them died when uh, at a very young age. So um, um, when I read, I, when I saw this on the registration cards that three of the children died as, as babies and, and young kids, um, I, I wanted to know um, whether this was a tragedy or if, th if this was normal at the time. And um, actually it was, and this was almost the average at the time, the child mortality was so high um, for um, children of working class families, the conditions were so hard. This was before we had vaccination. This was long before we had antibiotics. So um, out of five children, one didn't live up to his first birthday. So this was really, um, families were losing many, many children. But there were also bright sides to Joseph's childhood. And I think um, one of the most important things that influenced his life and that made him the person um, he was so well known later in, in New York City was gymnastics, Turnen, as we say in German. And this is a picture of Friedrich Pilates, Joseph's father. And he, um, this is a group of gymnasts. He was an active member of the local Turnverein, the gymnastic club. And um, as you see, he is leaning on, on a pair of barbells. So um, this was actually weightlifting, strength training was some, uh, something that um, Joseph Pilates knew about and learned about when he was um, still a child and, and a young man. So he was actually among the pioneers of weightlifting because weightlifting was only developed um, 
in the late 19th century, this was only the, the beginning of bodybuilding and, and strength, strength training. And Joseph Pilates was there from the beginning. So um, he was self-taught. He never had a job training in the area of health or body culture, but he was taught a lot by his father as well. And there, there were many things he could um, he, he was influenced by um, in his youth and childhood in, in Germany. Um, when he had finished school, he had um, to finish eight years of school. Uh, this was compulsory in Prussia at the time. And this was how they were able to end child labor. Um, he um, did job training, but not um, in the area of body culture. He had to do job training as a brewer. So... Um, he was actually a Bierbrauer Lehrling, as it says here in the old German writing, <laughs> which is um, really difficult to read. Um, it, um, this was his, the first place he lived after he had moved out from his family's house. So um, he, um, he was an apprentice of beer brewing in a really small, what we would call today microbrewery. It was in a in a restaurant which had its own brewery in the back, which was really normal at the time. But it was also the time when the big breweries um, started um, emerging in, in Germany. And Joseph Pilates worked there as well. Um, this is a picture of the Viersener Aktienbrauerei. It was in Viersen, which is a city near Mönchengladbach, where Joseph also lived for some time and he most probably worked there. Um, he had to work long days, like 10 or 12 hour shifts, and people had to work from Monday till Saturday. So there was not a lot of time um, he could spend with body culture, but he was definitely interested in it. And um, he took in a lot um, in Germany because at, um, at that time, in the beginning of the 20th century, there was a huge um, body culture scene in Germany. And there were so many different um, ideas and um, methods and also almost cults, <laughs> people who were like they, they were um, connecting an ideology with some method, some somatic, somatic method. Um, one very popular movement was nudism, the free body culture, we say in, in German. And um, just to, to show you how, um, how important this was, um, in the 1920s, before um, Joseph Pilates went um, to um, the United States, there were millions of people in Germany who were practicing nudists. And they met in, in clubs and, and they did exercises in the open air and nude. And this was like their feeling of liberty and uh, becoming a, a better um, human being. So um, even um, one of the most um, famous um, gymnasts at the time, Bess Manson Dijk, who had developed an exercise method for women, um, she, in her exercise book, which was published as early as 1906, um, she printed all the pictures. Um, the women who showed um, the exercises were nude. So, um, I mean, today this would not be possible, <laughs> I think, not even in Germany. Um, and um, but this is just to show you where Joseph Pilates came from, um, because like later when he was in New York, um, some clients were, um, found it strange that they had to um, work out in his studio and just wear a um, small bathing suit or um, bathing um, trousers. So um, actually, from Joseph Pilates' point of view, this was a lot <laughs> that they um, were wearing anything at all. So. Um, he didn't have a lot of time for this, for, for body culture. He, he got married um, very young, at young age. Um, he got married to this woman, Maria Tutman. She was his first wife. And um, she brought um, one son who was one and a half years old into the marriage. And they had two more children together, daughter Leni and son Hans Heinrich. And um, Hans Heinrich died when he was just 10 months old. So you see, the, the situation was still very much the same. Like the conditions of working class families um, at that time were still really tough. And um, shortly after, or 
some years after their son died, um, Maria, Maria also died when she was just um, 31 years old. So she died in um, 1912. This is her mother, Louise Tutman, Joseph's mother-in-law. And she was the one who actually raised Wilhelm, Maria's elder son, while Joseph sent the daughter, after Maria died, Joseph sent their daughter Leni to live with his father and brother. Um, Maria died in 1913. Um, there are several versions. It's not clear, and I was not able to um, find out um, whether he left Germany in 1912, before she died, and came back for her death because he was the one who signed her death certificate, or whether he left after her death. Um, the reason I, I could not um, prove this or disprove it was um, that he didn't register when he went to England, because in 1914 he, he was living in England. Um, he went there, he went into the country illegally which was really normal at the time for um, German workers. Um, a lot of Germans went to Britain because the wages were higher at the time. They just went there to work and most of them didn't register when entering. So um, in 1914, Joseph Pilates um, was living in England and this was not a good time because um, in the summer of 1914, the First World War started and Britain soon decided, um, in the fall of 1914, decided to intern civilians, male civilians of military age who came from Germany, Austria and Turkey, from the enemy countries, they were interned in order to prevent them to go back to their country of origin and join the army and fight against Britain. So um, Joseph was interned first in Lancaster in an internment camp, and then he was sent over to the Isle of Man, which is in the middle of the Irish Sea, in the middle of nowhere, actually. And there was the biggest um, internment camp for civilian internees, and um, there were more than 20,000 men um, interned in a huge um, camp. Um, they were living in wooden barracks, and, and you see the, the wooden <laughs> um, the wood on, on, on the floor, which is really important because um, it was raining most of the time on, on this island, so most of the time the floor was just mud, and, and this was the only way you could move <laughs> from one area to another in the camp. Um, for most of the internees, this was a really horrible time because they had been ripped out of their life. They were not able to provide for their families anymore. And um, they didn't know how long they would have to stay there. Nobody knew how long the war um, would go on. So one of the, the um, most important questions was how to spend the time in the camp and how to give them a sort of purpose, not to... Um, to stay sane, because that's actually the, we all know it now. Um, that's the most difficult thing if you're locked in somewhere. So um, and there were some organizations who were helping the, the um, internees to set up activities, to set up workshops, to, to get um, jobs actually in the camp. And one of the important activities was um, everything connected to sports. And um, there was a huge boxing scene in the camp. And this was really um, high quality um, boxing training, what they did. Um, because when these men came back to Germany in 1919 after the war, um, they won all the titles and all the weight classes in, in, um, in the German um, boxing tournaments in the first half of the 1920s. So they, uh, they really um, yeah, did something with their time. <laughs> and um, Joseph Pilates was part of that. He, um, he became an important figure in the camp and, and he was um, involved in, um, he was acting as a referee for boxing matches. Um, and he was also starting to develop his exercises and working out with his um, fellow internees and to help them keep um, strong, and but also to keep sane. And, and I think um, 
the time in the camp, um, for most of the people, it was really traumatic. But for Joseph Pilatus, this was the time when he found himself and, and he actually changed his vision of himself and became a sports teacher. Um, and, and that was um, what he did for the rest of his life. There's another thing I, I found um, from the camp. Um, I found this in the Federal Archives in Berlin. This is a leaflet from the camp announcing a circus show, a vaudeville world show. And Joseph Pilatus took part in this, and he did a modern strength act along with um, three inter other internees, and they called themselves the Four Pilatos. And they did another thing. Um, they called themselves the Pilates Company, and they did balances on chairs and ladders. And this is actually the, the only um, written proof I found of him taking part in a circus, <laughs> because um, that's another story he told um, told a lot when, when he was um, in the 50s and 60s that he had been traveling with a circus. I, I don't know. He, he might have, but he um, was definitely um, taking part in this circus in the camp. So um, when he um, came back to Germany in 1919, um, he didn't go back to his um, job as a beer brewer. He completely changed his life and he opened a boxing school. And he opened a boxing school in Gelsenkirchen. He also got married again. Um, he helped found the amateur organization of boxing in, in his area. But then two years later, he was kicked out of the amateur organization because um, he was also taking part in professional fights. So he was stepping in, into the ring as a boxer. At the age of um, 39, he was almost 40 years old. He was um, taking part in quite a lot of fights. He was not super successful. <laughs> he usually lost or... Uh, yeah. But... Um, but it, it's still um, really impressive. Uh, it was um, I was impressed by the fact that he um, he was able to um, um, do so many rounds in the ring because you have to be really fit, and he was really old for this. So um, yeah, I, I was going through all these journals. Um, it's called Box Sport um, in the 1920s, and it's really interesting because he's mentioned there several times the other boxers remembered him from the camp so this is um, how you see he, he was an important figure in, in the camp um, I'm almost <laughs> finished um, with the presentation I would like to um, show you um, one of the documents I, I think is really important for the Pilates method um, this is his first um, patent of the reformer it's there was another patent um, as early as um, 1922. He had patented the foot corrector. But in 1924, um, he, he patented the so-called Körperübungsgerät. And if you look at the picture, you see um, it's all there, like um, the functioning of, of the reformer. And um, on the picture, he was using a weight. Um, but um, in the text... Um, he says you, you could also use springs to work against. So the idea of using springs um, was there in 1924. And so um, he had been moving again. He had left his um, second wife <laughs> as well. Um, he had been moving to Hamburg. He was living in Hamburg at that time when he had this patented. Um, he was working in rehabilitation. Um, he was um, collaborating with um, some doctors. And in, in this um, patent application, um, he's um, sort of um, writing down the, the, the idea um, how he um, what he wanted to do um, was um, to build um, an apparatus everybody could use. So no matter um, what your um, what your body was like, no matter if you were an invalid who had lost um, his um, his leg or his arm, or if you were a professional dancer who had a problem with, with her knee, um, he, he had wanted to, to um, build this machine or this apparatus everybody could um, work on and improve. And you could improve from the point where you are. So um, you can, you can um, everybody can use it and, and can become he healthier. And um, yeah, I think this is a great idea, and um, yeah, and it was so interesting what he did with that later. <laughs> and so um, before 
yeah, we go over to the question part. Um, I'll just um, show you a picture of the ship <laughs> he boarded in 1926. And I think, and this is why I'm sitting here, I want to show you this. This is um, a suitcase, um, this kind of suitcase uh, cases um, people were using at the time. Um, these huge um, wooden boxes, actually. And I think in one of this, he had his um, stuff and he was taking it with him to New York. Yeah. Thank you um, very much. And I think yeah, that is so fascinating. I love the pictures and the historical perspective that you just brought to the to that um, presentation. So, so very cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it's just there's so much. Um, I would like to open this up to questions. Um, if anybody would like to, again, use the reaction emoji to raise their hand. Um, I can call out and you can go off mute and speak. Or if you'd rather just chat into the chat, please let me know. Um, Elisa just asked, are there Turnverein clubs still in Germany? Um, I said that right. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Turnverein, of course, um, my children go there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So they are and, still in and, existence. And how have they changed from what they were like before? Yeah, they, they have changed a lot. I mean, the, the Turnvereine, they, um, they were actually, um, they evolved in the 19th century and, and they were in the beginning and this was, um, the main goal was to do military training, <laughs> for, like, like to, to get the, the male youth fit for war. <laughs> that was, <laughs> that was the purpose of this. And this has really changed since. Yeah. And they, they had, at the time, they had only the classical, um, some classical methods. And um, for instance, the Turnverein where Joseph's father was active was an exception because they also practiced boxing, which was really um, a special thing to do um, around 1900 because um, boxing was banned at the time in Germany. It, um, it was considered as an English sport and England um, was the enemy. <laughs> so um, people, were, it was supposed to be unpatriotic if you, um, if you did boxing. Oh, in, in this so time so yeah wow. it was only um um allowed to do um boxing matches um in the public um after 1920. oh wow okay yeah. excellent awesome um ali you had your hand raised would you like to go off mute and ask oh sorry <laughs> yes i will go um sorry. Victoria, I'll be right with you. I'm sorry, I've got my four-year-old here. So okay, I, um, I want to thank you so much, um, Eva, for your book. Uh, it's phenomenal. Uh, my question is your process of deciphering fact from fiction, especially in your interviews and stuff with people. Um, I'm a Pilates instructor and over the past 26 years, um, heard some very uh, fantastical stories from my mentors and teachers, specifically ones of like, you know, the fire in the building at the end of Joe's life that, you know, he ultimately died from smoke inhalation and would have lived for many more years had that not been the case. So things like that, you know, perhaps, I don't know if you heard things in your interviews that you then had to go and debunk um, in terms of writing, you know, such a historically accurate piece. So that's my question, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. And I, I think for me, this was um, one of the um, most interesting things when writing this biography, too, because um, you really had to do some detective like <laughs> work to, to figure it out, because the, the problem was that not, not only other people were telling stories about Joseph Pilates, which seemed um, wild, <laughs> but he himself told so many um, wrong facts about Vasilev. <laughs> For instance, he always said he was born in 1880, three years earlier than he actually was born, because he wanted to, you know, um, to seem very young. And <laughs> if, if he said he was older than he actually was, he, of course, he, he seemed very young. <laughs> and um, this was one of the ways he wanted to um, promote his method. Um, One would think so, he would have chosen more than three years, right? <laughs> Go yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he could have added um, 10 or something. Right. Elisa. Yeah, but, yeah Elisa. I, I, I think I heard somewhere, maybe it was Kathy Barker Strack. She thought that when he came into the U.S., his, the date of his birth was recorded wrong. 
And um, it was like the, you know, with the date that we see here in the U.S. as to his birth date was just recorded wrong. But you have no. his original birth date there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was not recorded wrong in the official um, documentation. It's always the right date, <laughs> and so I don't think he, he he didn't remember it or anything. I, I think he just did it on purpose. He printed it on his card, eighteen eighty, and and I think that I think he was clever at um, PR. <laughs> and he yeah. and and he just he didn't care so much if every, everything is just. Uh, accurate and he didn't care so much about the details he also said he, he, um, he was born in Düsseldorf which was much more widely known in, <laughs> in the United States than nobody knew Mönchengladbach of course so he, he was just um, relaxed <laughs> at that point and um, yeah for me it was it was sometimes really difficult to um, determine whether something was um, true or not Many times it was a bit, there was a bit of truth in the story. And um, yeah, I just um, tried to um, compare what other people said. And, and if, if I was able to find some written documentation, I could always um, turn to that. And um, for instance, the fire is something I was never able to um, make up my opinion about it. Because I, I like um, when I read about it, there are so many different accounts and Every every account is really different, and and then um, when I was thinking about it, I just thought that um, I mean Joseph Pilates was a smoker. He was a heavy smoker. He had been smoking for decades. So and he died of lung emphysema, which is really normal. This is an illness. Many smoke. It, it just um, this is what smoking does <laughs> to your lungs. And and Joseph Pilates, he, he was he thought that by his breathing method and his breathing exercises he could um he, he, he could not be hurt by this but this was not true and i think um I, I i was not able to find out about the fire how severe it was and if it um happened at all but um i don't think this um was the reason he developed this um lung emphysema because he had been smoking so so i yeah this was how i was trying to um determine <laughs> yeah and That's a great, a great word to determine what was fact and what was fiction. And, yeah. you know, there are, there are stories and, and it's like the telephone game where it changes a little bit, every person that it goes through, you know, to get to where it is. Yeah. Now, and, so. and also memory. I mean, this is how memory works. Memory. Like if I yeah. remember things from my childhood right now, it's not accurate. It's more right. like a feeling. And every time I, I'm telling this, I change it a bit. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's true for like, if, if people um, talk about him and, and tell their memories about him, him the same thing happens so you just mm -hmm. have to treat it as a it, it, it's a personal thing um it's a memory and a memory is not not a recording <laughs> yeah. right exactly um so if i'm going to go back in the chat a little bit because there's a couple of questions to go through mm -hmm. um vivian was asking can you tell us what the exact translation is of the name of that first reformer i think if you go back on the slide mm -hmm. it was a really yeah. long word that you said in german yeah. <laughs> so the ver the the literal okay. translation um would be body training device body training device and, okay yeah and and i think two years later he had it patented in the united states and then he called it gymnastic apparatus Oh, in the United yeah. States when he came here yeah. he called it gymnastic yeah. apparatus. Yeah, he, okay. no he, he did the application before he um He came to, or he he came um, in 1925. He went um, to New York for a couple of months, and then he did the patent application. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, Monica was asking, do you know what happened to his daughter Lini? And did you try to reach her? Did you try to reach out to her, or maybe her family, to ask her about Joseph Pilates? Yeah, um, I, I was trying to reach out to, to the family. Um, I, I could not find out what, what happened to her. I um, could only follow her life um, until the 1950s. She got married. Um, she, she stayed in touch um, with her father. She even visited him um, shortly before the Second World War started. And, um, and she received um, pack packages from him after the war. Um, he helped her. And then... Um, I don't know what happened to her. I was talking to the family of um, her uh, her half brother Wilhelm, and they they were staying in, in Germany, and they were in touch with her, 
um, until the 1950s, and, and they thought um, that she had also um, emigrated to the United States. But I could not find her. I, I don't know. But I mean, she wouldn't. Um, she, she was born in um, 1907, I think. So she, she would not be. Um, she would have passed away by today. now. Yeah, she yeah. would have passed away, yeah. and she didn't have children. Like when, like um, the time when when I found records of her, um, and and she was at the age um, she could have had children. She didn't have any, so she probably didn't have children. And and I can't remember. Were you in contact with his brother's family that was in Missouri? Is that correct? Um, no, 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 no. I I, I was not. Um, We're not able to get any information. Not in contact there. with them. No. Um, and so uh, the other question was, do we know what happened to Lenny's children? And we we don't know. Uh, yeah, only Wilhelm. So Wilhelm, right. um, he, he stayed in Germany. He, he, there's one story I heard from the widow of his son. Um, she she told he didn't know that his last name was Pilatus because he had been raised by his grandmother. Um, his last name was um, Tutman. Tutman. Mm -hmm. And um, so he thought his name was Tutman. And when he got married... That's when he learned that his last name was actually Pilatus. And uh, there's a story in the family that his wife almost um, decided against marrying him because she didn't like the name. <laughs> and um, and she was somehow she didn't like the fact that she was going to marry someone who didn't know his own name. Oh. So, um, but in the end, um, they, they stayed together and had a son. Yeah, oh, and wow. I was speaking to his widow, so the widow of his Was son. she the one that went to the gym with the last name Pilates and they didn't yeah. really, did the, Can yeah. you tell that story? Yeah, that, that's I another, still go back to that story. Yeah, that, that's another um, strange story which tells you a lot about um, Germany and Pilates. Um, the, the widow of um, Joseph's stepson's son, um, she went to a Pilates class um, about um, 2010, and there was a Pilates class in her local community center, and she had to write her name in a list. Um, and then when she wrote down her name, the woman who was standing beside her told her, oh, you're so stupid. You don't have to, na to write the name of the class. You have to write your family name. And she, and she told her, no, that is my name. And <laughs> I think, um, yeah, this is um, put because, two two together. <laughs> yeah, in, in Germany, people are not aware that there was a person, Joseph Pilates, um, most people know about the Pilates method. Many people practice it, but they don't know about the person and that he was from Germany. Mm -hmm. So interesting. I love that story. Um, Joan is asking, do you know when Clara, um, Joe and, met, and Clara met and where? So uh, when and where did Joe and Clara meet? As far well, as we know, I, it was yeah. on a ship, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I think so. I, I, I couldn't like I, I thought this is I thought this must be one of the wild stories because you don't meet on a ship um, <laughs> and then stay together for the rest of your life. But I was not able to find any um, for, um, opportunity for them to meet before because he was living in Hamburg. She was living in Kaiserslautern. I didn't find any um people they both knew or anything it, it might have been they might have um, known each other but um, Joseph Pilates ha had been married at that time and he was living in Hamburg with another woman so um, <laughs> this would so I don't know if he um, I think he re I think he met her on the ship it's quite the love story, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like the Titanic. It's quite the exciting yeah. story. Um, Elisa also said, um, I'm going to read what she wrote in the chat. I've heard from different Pilates elders and sometimes videos that Joe taught people to use cold showers, scrubbing of the skin during showers, nasal cleansing and skin exposure to sunlight and fresh air. Are these all trends from that time as well? You were talking about some of the trends in, in yeah. Germany at that time. Is this something that was yeah. being practiced on a more bigger basis? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I, I found, because I, I, in order to find out more about, because that was really one of the, the things which was really surprising for me, this um, huge scene of body culture in Germany. I, ha I had not known about that. I had, had not learned about that in my, um, at the university or uh, so. And, um, and I read some, some of the books, some, some of the exercise books, and everybody says you have to take cold showers, you have to scrub as hard as possible. And, and that, yeah, so I, I think um, Joseph, he, he really took um, all of that in, and then um, he, he made his own, um, yeah, he turned it into his own method. 
So interesting. Um, Gaya is asking about the the first photo that you showed was the building where he would where he grew up, where yeah. he was from. Um, is there a plate on it, like a historical plate? Um, and yeah. are people in that village or um, town aware of their citizen popularity now nowadays yeah. because of him? Yeah, it keeps changing. It, it, they were not, absolutely not. And it was not the city who put up the, the plate, but it was um, Lolita San Miguel and Kathy Corey and a group of, of people from around the world who, who um, collected the money um, and, and convinced the mayor of Mönchengladbach um, to set up a, a, a memory plate. And it's um, next to the house. Um, it's at the place, um, a small square next to the house. And, but now, actually, um, it, it, it's changing a bit. Um, th there's the Heritage Platz Heritage Conference, um, which takes place every two years um, in Mönchengladbach. And, and, and they were really working hard to get in touch with the um, city um, council and, and the mayor. And um, last thing I heard is they are planning to name a, a square or a street um, after Josef Pilatus, which is really something, yeah, wonderful and <laughs> um, yeah, something new. And maybe they're even thinking about setting up a small museum or um, something uh -huh. like that. Yeah, but that's okay. um, still um, not very cool. Um, Eva, one of our participants asked if we could stop doing screen share so she could see more of a gallery view. So I don't know if we want to yeah, go sure. off screen yeah. share for yeah. a few, and then mm -hmm. if we have to go back onto it, we can. Yeah. Um, thanks. And then um, there is, there's everybody. <laughs> there is still another question um, from, I'm not sure of the name, but it looks like maybe this person writes, according to some records, Clara had a brother in New Jersey. Do we know anything about that? Um, I'm not sure if you do no, much research on Clara because yeah, your work yeah. was more on Joe. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, actually, I, uh, there's, um, I didn't do research about that, but it's it's quite possible um, mm -hmm. because um, th there were many. Also, um, two of Joseph's um, siblings had um, had been emigrating to the United States, and many people. Um, I mean, Joseph and Clara, they were quite late in the 1920s. This was actually the end of um, um, of the, the big immigration waves from Germany. But um, in the late 19th century and, and the big um, beginning of the 20th century, there was millions of people um, coming to the United States from Germany. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to be mindful of time. So we have about 10 minutes. Um, and Eva, um, the... The next Eva in Austria. Would you like to um, okay. go off mute and ask your Hi. question? Hi. Hi, Eva. Hi. Uh, <laughs> wir könnten noch Deutsch sprechen, aber I'm speaking English too, so <laughs> everybody can understand me. Do you know something about Max Schmeling? The, they were together. I read it in your book and also in some, I'm also a history teacher, so I'm really interested in that. I'm so thankful that I can take part here. <laughs> Do you know something about this connection between Pilates and Max Schmeling, the boxer? Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I was trying to find out about this because uh, this is just so um, interesting. And Max Schmeling, he's uh, so popular in, in Germany, yeah. especially uh, this would have been. Yeah. But the, the problem is I, I didn't, um, I only found out that um, they were connected via um, Ned Fleischer. And Ned Fleischer was um, a boxing oh. journalist from New York. And, and he... Um, um, had been traveling in Europe several times to find boxing talents. And he says um, in his book that Joseph Pilates um, introduced him to Max Schmeling. And Ned oh. Fleischer was also the one who convinced Joseph Pilates to come over to, um, to New, New York, York and um, um, set up a studio there. So that's, um, I, I couldn't find out more about the connection and if Max Schmeling ever went to the studio. But there were in, in the early years there were many boxers working out in the studio. Um, there, were, there were some um, well-known boxers um, who attended the studio. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I want to um, respond back to that last question about Clara's brother. And um, Elisa did write in the chat that I think the next book club with Kathy Barth Barker Strack, who had. Um, some research, uh, I think, on Clara will might be able to tap into that 
questions yeah, and answers. Yeah, so. and um, I can on, only say that um, this will be a great book. And and she, Kathy Buckerstrack, I, I was really a lot in touch with her because she did so much research about you know everything. She she found so many people um, who could still tell her something um, about Joseph and his family, and she wanted to know about everything. <laughs> yeah, right, about <laughs> Clara and her family, and yeah. So I'm sure she will be able to tell you. Very cool. I'm going to open this next question to everybody and you can write your answer in the chat if you want to. But was there anything, did you discover anything surprising about Joe that you didn't expect um, after reading this book? Or if Eva, I'd love to hear what you, if you discovered anything surprising about Joe doing your research on this book. Yeah, uh, oh, many, many things. <laughs> I think so. for me, um, it was it was really so surprising that he, he was so much into boxing because I absolutely hadn't associated boxing with Pilates, <laughs> which was like for me, it was always this group of women um, <laughs> doing Pilates exercises. And, and I thought about Madonna and, <laughs> you know, like um, famous uh, actor, actresses and um so this was really surprising to find out that he was um he was actually a boxer and and <laughs> yeah that was one of the things yeah I was surprised when I read it that he had been married a couple of times. I didn't, you know, again, like Ali said, you hear stories and I don't know, I didn't realize the history, the lineage of that. So that and that he had, you know, a couple of children, that was surprising to me. Um, Elise writes, she was surprised that almost all the stories that Romana told us were not true. <laughs> Monica, that he liked women a lot and Clara was okay with that. Oh yeah, that was another one. Yeah, I'm surprised by that too. Yeah, yeah. She tolerated things that I don't think I would have tolerated. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? I have another one that I can ask, but if anybody um, in the group has a question, just let me know. You can either raise your hand or put it into the chat. Um, but I was gonna ask Ifa, do you know anything about Hannah and what happened to Hannah after Joe's death? No. I um <laughs> no I was not even um able to to um find out which her um her family name because because I I found about five different versions of family names and I I couldn't find her I I, I was looking for her on ancestry and I I couldn't um there there are, there are different stories that she got married that she moved away um sometime after his death but um i, I was not able to to find out maybe um kathy <laughs> kathy knows more oh yeah and, uh, and regarding that can we explain who hannah was uh yeah H hannah was um sh she was working in the studio and so many people remember her as like the the one person who was always there and 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 she was doing everything in the studio and helping um joe and clara because i mean in, in the time when the studio was really successful in the 50s and 60s they were old or, already so um they needed help and and hannah was um and i'm probably not going to say her last person. name right but is it sakmirda is that how you say it hannah sakmirda yeah, that, that, something like Is that. that. Right? <laughs> but okay. it might be Zakamirska, Zakamira. I, I just okay. found um, a lot of versions. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, and then there was a, some questions um, the last time we had met about the the, the apparatus and the patent the patent patenting of the apparatus and how the apparatus kind of came to be. And then, you know, there was questions about, did he know Graz and have a deal with Graz? Or do you, can you just speak a little bit about the apparatus once he was in New York and, and what that looked like or how that worked? Yeah, I, I think um, the apparatus for him was really important. I mean, that's, that was how it started. I mean, he, he um, had had the first um, devices patented in, um, when he was still in Germany. So he loved developing new um apparatus and he um i think in the beginning his plan was to to really sell it um on a worldwide scale because otherwise it wouldn't have made sense that he patented um things like the Körperübungsgerät in several countries because this is really expensive and and, and you have to pay to to keep a patent um um running so um he um he was planning to Became really successful very quickly um, after he um, came to New York, and this didn't happen. So in, in the end, um, it was like that. He built <laughs> he built um, the devices in his um, 
in the he had a small workshop um, where he built them and he sold um, them to clients who, who needed, um, for instance, a reformer or a chair at home. Um, or they, they some some of them took it on um, when they went on tour. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. So interesting. I didn't realize until I spoke with you the last time that the patent has a, a you know, it's only a, a it's only a, um, it only works for a certain amount of years and then mm. it's it's gone and so anybody can take that information, I guess, if they get a hold of your, you know, your specifications and then build their own apparatus because yeah. All yeah, and and you can change it a little and, bit too. And, and and we can look uh, look at all all his um, patent applications. Um, on, uh, they are all in the database of the U.S. Patent and Trademark offices, and yeah, it's really interesting because he didn't only um, he didn't only design um, exercising devices. He he also um, developed a game. It, it was called the catapult, <laughs> something you, you could you, use to play a game. Um, in the park or um and he also um yeah he developed this v bed <laughs> the the v shaped bed um oh yeah and yeah. some chairs also for for the sitting room not only um chairs um like for furniture uh-huh yeah so, so interesting um this was some part of him yeah uh-huh that was so interesting. Um, Eva, thank you so much. Um we have like just one or two more minutes. Is there anything anyone else would like to ask or share? Um, Helena says there are many sites on any. Oh, are there any sites online that show step by step? No, there are many sites online that show step by step building of your own apparatus. You need to be a skills carpenter. Yeah, that would not be for me. <laughs> but I think there probably are ways to build your own. Um, Elisa, you can see a video of that on Pilates Ology. We visited Joe's summer home in Beckett, Mass. And there is some do it yourself. Oh, that's very awesome. So cool. Yeah. I'd be afraid to tackle that project, but I think that's a great idea. There's a reformer, but I'll say that we do have um, directions for a ladder barrel. Um, I believe a pedipole, a, a two by four, if you're doing your foot exercises. Uh -huh. um, Maybe the yeah. bean bag. I know that there's, there's some of those. Bean bag. Be yep, bean bag is really easy to make. And uh, you can use the same instructions um, for the ladder barrel to make your own small barrel because the barrel is the same size. Right, right. So awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I would just like to say um, a huge thank you to Aoife for being our first Pilatesology book club presenter. Um, it was amazing. Um, thank you and so much. I, I love that. I always say I would love to do round two with you and we can go into his middle years maybe or something. <laughs> um, I great. think that was great. <laughs> So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm, I'm going to just pass off. Navi, do you want to come back on one more time and just share again what we have coming up? Um, I don't know if we had dates set yet, but in June we have Kathy. And maybe you could just yes, speak into that absolutely. a little bit more. Absolutely. And um, we do have some dates um, in the next month, which is June. Um, we're having Love All Around by Kathy Barker Strack. Uh, which is about Romana Krizanowska, and that will be on the 24th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's a Thursday. Um, and you can, if you want to uh, get the book, uh, you can buy it at kathystrack.com uh, if you would like to attend our next meeting. And then after that, we have Breath by James Nestor, who will be coming on July 20th and which again is a book about breathing. And that book is, it was, I'm pretty sure a New York Times bestseller, so you can kind of get it anywhere. Um, it's a widely available and it's very easy to find. And then um, August, 2021, we have uh, Lolita San Miguel, and she's going to come talk to us about her life and her autobiography, um, which is, gonna be she's so sweet she's um i don't know if any of you have seen um her before but she'll be there on august 12th at 1 p.m so yeah <laughs> i hope to see you all there thank you all so much for coming today thank you so much Cheryl. thank you all thank you for organizing this and thank you eva Monica, it's wonderful to see you. I see you there. And Gaia and Joanne, Joan and Eva, thank you for your presentation and your book. We, we, I mean, this was awesome. I want you to do more. Can you do a <laughs> volume two, please? <laughs> Keep going. 
Thank and the recording will be up on the um, Pilates Allergy Book Club page, right, Elisa? Yes, we'll awesome. be putting this up on the page uh, so you can come back and watch the video again if you like or send other people to the Book Club, Club page if they'd like to see the dates for the next books or um, sign up for the book club so that they'll get the notification for the Zoom links. Um, but we'll be putting everything, all the videos up on that page so you could come back to it anytime to watch it for free as well. So. Can we all give a big smile for a screenshot? Yeah, that's Everybody great. Ready? One, Got two, it. three. Awesome. Thank Got you so it. much, everybody, for attending. And we look forward to seeing you in June. Eva, once again, thank you. I hope we can stay in touch. It was amazing. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming. Bye. It was so good to see you. Yes, you, you too. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.